did you hear about so-and-so? They did this and that, and Bishop so-and-so said this, and Dr. so-and-so said that about them, and well, we heard about this and we heard about that. You ever heard of South Bend Shovel Slam? No. That's him. Back in 58, he murdered his whole family and half the people on his block with the snow shovel. Been hiding out in this neighborhood ever since. It's called gossip and called slander. And it messes up our pool, our understanding of knowledge, our relationships with one another, and especially our relationship with God. Let's talk about it. Hi, welcome to the Catholic Skeptic. My name is Hugh. Glad you could join me today. Uh, we, know, we, we think about all of the things that are going on right now, especially in the blogosphere, um, you know, the, the, the issues uh, amongst Catholic vloggers concerning all of the, the controversies with the Pope and various bishops and things like that and uh, issues like that. One of the things we don't take into account is how we perceive and grab a hold of knowledge and what we should or shouldn't share, what we should or shouldn't say. You know, we're affected by all of these things. And they affect us and our walk with God and our heart and everything else. There's a lot of things that, that matter in our lives in, in terms of understanding this. Uh, and, and we want to we have some, some, some solid spiritual principles, some true godly principles um, from the Word of God concerning how we are to conduct ourselves as, 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 as believers. And this actually, this teaching applies to you, whether you're Catholic or Protestant or Orthodox. Any human being applies to, but especially to those who are believers and truly consider yourselves followers of Christ. Uh, so let's let's get into this. We're going to start in the book of Proverbs. This is kind of going to kind of be a little Bible study uh, this particular episode. But I want to look in the book of Proverbs, chapter four. Proverbs chapter four, just to start here. And you know we're told about t- we're told and instructed in Proverbs several times. He says in verse chapter four, verse thirteen, take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not into the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. Get away from that. Don't go down the wrong path. Don't start following the wrong things. Now, when it comes to some elements of wickedness, you know, we can think in terms of doctrinal truth there. We can think in terms of, 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 of something that's real obvious. Don't violate those particular sins we see. But we don't often see the subtler forms of evil and wickedness that are out there. You know, and we're, and we're told to really be on guard about these things. He says, the path of the just, in verse 18, is, a sh- is as a shining light. It shines more and more into the perfect day. What's he telling us there? In other words, when you're on the right path, the just path, the correct path in life, generally your path should be getting clearer as you go. I don't mean that everything around you is always going to go hunky-dory. You could have lots of confusion and mess going on around you. But inside, you should, become, you should be getting less confused, more certain, more confident. Uh, you should be on a road to certitude in your life, confidence and certainty about, uh, about things. This is, this, is, this is a principle that's clearly of God and something we want to understand in our lives. But then he contrasts it. He says, the way of the wicked, verse 19, is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. They don't even know what they're falling all over. They're just, there's all kinds of a mess. Uh, you know, they, they fall in the dark paths and don't even realize it. You can easily begin to go down the wrong path. You know, Jesus warned us in the Bible. He said, uh, you know, take heed that the light that is in you be not darkness. You know, and, and it says, like, well, what does that mean, the light that's in me, darkness? In other words, take heed that you're not seeing distorted light, something that sort of looks like light and isn't really light. You know, he says, if, if, if that's the case, Jesus warns us, he says, you know, you know, how great is that darkness? It's a very dangerous path when you get caught up in those sort of things. And, you know, you can be doing the right thing for the wrong reason. You can be saying the right thing for the wrong reason. Or you can be saying the wrong thing because you think you have a right reason, but it's but you're still, your information is off because you're kind of crusading or, or, or pursuing a certain direction. So we have to be aware of these things. We're told to pay attention to what goes in and out of our mind. We should, we're, we're, we're to have an awareness of these things. He tells, he tells us in verse 20, he says, My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear to my, to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Keep them, meaning you could lose them. Keep them, hold on to them. For they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. Or to all, you know, and health to all their flesh. In other words, God's words are life. There's a, there's a feeding and it's going to affect you physically. It's going to affect you mentally. It's going to affect you spiritually. It's going to affect you in every area of your life. And then he says in verse 23, now in an older English versions, like the King James, the Douay Rames version, 
uh, you know, you'll see, keep thy heart, keep thy heart with all diligence. The word means to guard. So guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the forces of life, the issues of life. You need to guard your heart. Now, he's not talking here about the physical muscle that pumps blood in your body. We're not talking about, you know, you know, plaque buildup and making sure you, you know, you eat the right diet and exercise. You should do all those things. It's great for your health physically, absolutely. But, you know, we're talking here about the spiritual element, your soul. Like, what affects it? You need to guard what goes inside. Guard what you pay attention to, what you focus on, where your attention, where your direction is on, what your mind is on. It'll affect everything about you. You know, uh, you know, if you, if I, if you for, for example, I found if I, if I feed on a steady diet of bad news, the world's news, and some people are obsessed with the news, and morning, first thing I do is find out what happened in the day, the world, what's happening in the world, and, and sometimes they'll feed on it all the time, P- political things sometimes can, you can get to the point where you're angry and frustrated and depressed, upset, because you're taking that information on, you know, spiritually in the church, this becomes the case, when people become so obsessed with, uh, amongst my Catholic brothers and sisters, uh, and those vloggers who are so obsessed with errors and things they see, you begin to get conspiracy minded and everything is your, you're circling around every little detail and trying to see what's really happening and all the subtleties of the devil. Now we're supposed to not be ignorant of the devices of the devil. We're supposed to be aware of the wiles of the devil. We're not supposed to be, um, you know, uh, unaware of, of strategies against us. But sometimes people can look for a devil under, under, under every bush, under every rock, under every crevice, see something in everything else, and, and paranoia and, and, and it can set in, and you can become really kind of out there. All right, when I was young, I was a fan of the X-Files. It had a lot of conspiracy theory stuff in it. It's fun. Conspiracy theories can be interesting. Uh, conspiracy in itself is not a bad thing. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a crazy thing automatically, you know. All a conspiracy is defined as is, is, is the agreement of two people together to commit a crime. That's one of, the, one of the working definitions of conspiracy. You know, there are conspiracies all the time, but you can get caught up in things where you're seeing it everywhere all the time. The old phrase, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're out, not out to get you. You can reverse that. All right? Sometimes they're not out to get you just because you're paranoid. The, the, that presumption, and a lot of it can come from pride and other things in your life and personal arrogance. And We have to be aware of all these things in our life and aware of, of, of how we follow these things. So we're told to guard against these things, to protect us. He goes on to say, and, and that was Proverbs uh, 423, 424, he says, put away from the forward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. Watch your words. Watch how you talk. Now I'm talking about so much about saying bad words or swearing, but you know, you, you, you gossip and slander and, and hearsay and, and, and the, latest, the latest word about this or that or this person or that person. You know, watch out about that. All right, put away that kind. That's a distorted. Uh, perverse just means dis- to distort. To pervert something is to distort something. You can have perverse words and that you're distorting facts and information and, and sending them out. That's something we have to be aware of. All right? He says, let your eyes look right on and thine eyelids look straight before thee. In other words, keep a straight focus in, in, uh, in the direction you're going and what you, what you know is true. He says, ponder the path of thy feet. Let all thy ways be established. Turn not from the right hand or the left. Remove thy foot from evil. That, that need to get away from that evil, that, 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 that whole direction and that mindset. You know? But some people, they're, they're right away ready to, they want to hear things and they want to spread it to somebody else. They want to hear more information about someone and something else. The latest gossip, the latest information. That's, uh, that's insane in the church world. That's insane in the Christianity world, period. I knew it when I was a Protestant, I know it was a Catholic. It's just, it's there. There's a, a mind that wants to go that way. We have to be aware of these things. And, and wanting to hear something and wanting to tell somebody else. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 23 says this, Whoso keeps or guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. Whoever keeps your mouth and tongue keeps your soul from troubles. You could take on a whole world of more trouble in your life and be troubled inside and ill at ease and tormented and confused and have no peace in your heart, all in the name of a righteous cause. You got to be careful of that. If that's something we have to be aware of in our lives that uh, we do it. So, you know, guard your mouth, guard what you say, watch and be aware of our words. Proverbs 18, 13 tells us he that answers a matter before he hears it, it's a folly and a shame to him. A lot of times we're so quick to provide an answer. We don't know all the facts and all the information, but we've got to get out there and, 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 and spearhead it, and be the, at the front of it and, 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 and go after it. That's dangerous. It's something that, that, that can be damaging to our lives, and we need to guard against it. It's a, it's a very dangerous pattern that we can easily fall into. Um, in, in Proverbs chapter 26 and verses 
20 through 22. He says, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. So where there's no tail bearer, the strife ceases. The tail bearer, the storyteller, the one that's got to go after it. You know, uh, you know the. It's funny, you know. Everybody knows the the, 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 the famous line in, in Pirates of the Caribbean: "Dead men tell no tales." Well, you know what? The Bible says you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God in Colossians three three. All right, we're to be dead to the world, and alive unto God. You know, but if we're always alive to this world and always trying to make sure we get the, the latest information and do this and that. Uh, and, and make sure we're the first one to, to reveal something or acknowledge something or, or make sure you pass a story on that you heard. You just can't wait to tell somebody else. That's a deadly, deadly, wicked thing. We don't know. Many times, many, many believers don't see, recognize just how evil that kind of practice is. But it is. And it's a very deadly trap that we can get into. All right. And a lot of it comes down to our own perceptions. How do we perceive things? How do we look at certain circumstances in our life? How do we perceive uh, what's happening in our lives? In um, Proverbs chapter 28, this is a verse, by the way, I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 26. This is a verse that hit me strong when I was in Protestant Bible college, when I was hearing all sorts of things. One of the messages that was real big uh, in the particular Bible college I was in was this principle of following your heart. This idea that God just speaks to you in your heart. And, and so you'll, you'll know in your heart it's true. And, and, there, was this, and there was this mindset about trusting your heart and following your heart. And uh, we, we used to have a, a song in our chapel services at the Bible school, you know, follow your heart, not your understanding. You know, follow your heart, not your reasoning. Deep inside of you, you know what to do. It, it was all beautiful. It would always be sung with such, oh, that sounds so beautiful. Well, Proverbs chapter 28 and 26 freaked me out when I read it. I've been hearing that song so much and people talking that way where I was. And it's one of the things, very probably inklings of what led me home to the Catholic Church years later. But Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26 says, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Really? He that trusts in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Well, there's a couple of things there. First of all, apparently walking wisely does not involve trust in your heart. You don't want to trust your heart. What does that mean, trust your heart? Trusting your own perceptions of everything, your inner sense of things. I'm not saying that's not important to you or your inner sense shouldn't matter. You should have inner peace in your life. And sometimes a lack of that peace can, can give you a warning you're going down the wrong path. I'm not d dismissing that as unimportant entirely, but it's not exclusive. My, a lot of my Protestant brothers and sisters, you, you, you think it's crazy that we believe the, the, the infallibility of the Catholic Church, and the infallibility of the Pope and matters of faith and morals. Yet many of many times... You believe, and I used to believe in the infallibility of my own heart to make sure I, I just, I'll just know inside. I'll just know inside. No, you can't follow that. You have to walk in wisdom. There is, there is instruction of what wisdom is about. And the word fool itself is interesting. Everybody knows that loves to quote the Psalm, you know, you know, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. We think that's just the working definition of a, of, of a fool from the Bible is an atheist or something. You can, there's a lot of ways one can be a fool. All right. And in Proverbs chapter 12, Proverbs, for the book of Proverbs chapter 12 uh, and verse 15, it says this, Proverbs twelve fifteen, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkens unto counsel is wise. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. You really got to watch out when you're doing what's right just in your own eyes. We all, well, I know I'm doing the right thing. I know I'm right on this issue. I know I'm right. I'm arguing. People have conversations. They get into mindsets like this all the time. Listen, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 23, talks about the fact that the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your own heart can deceive you. You know, uh, that's something we don't often think about. It says over, uh, you know, in um, the book of uh, Zephaniah, the pride of thine heart has deceived thee. The pride of thine heart. You can get deceived in your own heart by things. You know, become caught up in, in your own sense of certainty of myself and where I'm at, uh, you know, how, you know, certain you are. Yeah, and, and people extend this out to every opinion they have about everything, you know, and, and uh, don't tell me, I don't know. And it affects how we talk, how we listen, how we perceive, how we conduct ourselves with one another. All right. It makes a difference. Jesus told us in Mark chapter four and verse 24, take heed what you hear, take heed what you hear. Watch out what you're listening to all the time. What are you, who, who, whose voices are whispering in your ear? What are we hearing all the time? And then we're told in, in, in that's Mark 4, 24, in, in Luke chapter 8 and verse 18, which is both of these are dealing with the parable of the, of the sower and other things that Jesus is talking about. He says, take heed how you hear. How you listen makes a difference. Do, how do we listen? You know, 
um, uh, Stephen Covey, the, the, the uh, late Stephen Covey, who wrote the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, one of the habits, I don't forget which number it is in, in the list, but he, he said is when it comes to communication, he said, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. And what does that mean exactly? Most of the time when you're talking to somebody where, who dis, you disagree with, when we're listening back and forth, what are we doing? When we're in a conversation, when a person's talking to you about something, you know, that you don't agree with it, you're thinking about how to respond back to them. You're concerned about being understood by them. So you want to take whatever they're saying and make sure you filter it in such a way. Why? That comes out of insecurity. Why are we afraid to hear what someone else has to say? You know, I, 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 I'm fascinated as I, as I, as I read the, the commentaries on, on this show. I've talked about before with some of my, my Protestant friends here who, who, who for some reason keep tuning in and keep discussing things with me. You know, some were some very sharp and intellectual, and sophisticated. Others just 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 touting the same message over and over again. No matter what I say, they don't they don't argue. They just advocate. They advocate for a position. They don't try to argue why it might be true. They just keep saying it over and over again, quoting things, cutting, pasting long sermons and things uh, on there. You know, it's like, are you afraid to hear another side of the view? Are you afraid to hear an alternative view? Look, I lived for years in the evangelical Protestant world. I lived in a world where, you know, it was just the Bible, sola scriptura, sola fide. I embraced all those positions very strongly, could argue them very effectively, I thought. You know, but as I began to, it began to wear down on me, I began to open myself up to listen. I found out there's a lot of things in this Bible I didn't know, things I didn't see before, things I didn't get. And when I took the time to listen, it's scary that you to find out. It's a scary thing. Nobody wants to believe they're wrong. All right, just the only, uh, something I saw on, 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 on a calendar that had quotes from famous people said, you know, it was, I think it was Dick Cavett who said, it's the rare man who hears what he does not want to hear. We don't like to hear what we don't want to hear, you know, when it's con- contrary to what we believe, you know. But see, if you're secure in your in foundation of your life, you shouldn't be afraid to hear other opinions and hear them out here clearly and try to understand them before you are, try to refute them, you know. Do you want to understand or do you just want to refute now, yes, obviously, when you hold a conviction or strong, you're going to refute it. People have written me on things process, and I've refuted their arguments. I've come back at them. It's like, well, are you willing to listen? Well, I've listened. I've been in. I lived in your world first. I lived in your world for for for, for decades. You know, as a Protestant minister and an evangelical, minister, I understand that pro, that concept. But I was a pastor. I lived it, preached it, taught it, and uh, functioned in it fully. You know, and and opening myself up to the Catholic Church that I'd long before rejected, and beginning to argue. I think that that took some understanding. So there needs to be understanding, but it's amazing how many people don't want to understand. You know, one of the biggest marvels in my own personal testimony was the fact that members of my own church, I don't know if some of you still do do or don't watch these videos. I think some of them probably do secretly watch them. I'm amazed at how many people didn't talk to me at all, didn't even want to know, didn't even call me up or ask me a question or text me and say, hey, hey, what's up with you? Why did you become a Catholic? Nobody wanted to even hear it. Nobody wanted to discuss it. They, many of them think that the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon and the seed of the Antichrist, and they, they, they think they might be concerned with my soul. I had one or two that were, were that, 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 that talked to me, asked questions, and even debated with me a little bit and presented videos to me. But most of them didn't just cut me off with no more effort than you turn off a light switch. It's interesting, you know, even though they knew them for years and they considered me their pastor. Understanding an alternative point of view is something you really, really, really find, and making a change is something people very rarely do in that manner. So they'll do it emotionally or something, but if they'll do it really from thinking it out, that takes some effort. Right. And I'm not patting myself on the back saying I took the effort. I'm saying we need to learn to expand our mind somewhat to really be willing to listen if we're going to really have conversations with people and we're going to be effective in, in, in sharing to them or ministering to them as well. These things are affected by our life all right, and how we perceive things and what we do. You know, and again, because the heart is deceitful, you don't always get your heart. Understand this. How do I know what's in somebody's heart or how do I know what's in my heart? Well, Jesus did give us one clear clue. Uh, he says in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What we say a lot reveals a lot what's going on inside of us. And he, and he make no mistake, Jesus cared about words. I know it's real popular. They say oh, words don't matter. And, you know, there's a, uh, in the Catholic world, we have this, you know, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. Well, first of all, it's been researched by several very strong very, people who very deeply. St. Francis of Assisi never said that. It's been attributed to him, but he never said it. Second of all, Francis preached a lot, he even preached to the birds, preached to them, all right? Pra- you know, you call it practice preaching or, or just preaching, whatever. He, he preached all the time. But second of all, words do matter. They matter to Jesus. In that same chapter 12 of Matthew, in verse 36, he says, Every idle word that a man shall speak, he'll give an account on the day of judgment. Every idle word. 
And what's an idle word, by the way? I, when you're being idle, what's happening? You're not working. Well, what are the idle words? Non-working words, unimportant words, just jabbering on. I says, that does matter. What you're saying does tell us a lot about ourselves. And what we say comes out of our mouth tells a lot about us. He went on to say, that's verse 36, verse 37. He says, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So, yeah, words do matter to God. All right. And, and, and so an awareness of that makes a difference in our life. All right. And, and, and it makes a difference in our life, not only concerning what we're saying, but what we're speaking, how we talk makes a difference. Um, in the book of James chapter three, there's an, a long kind of, uh, dissertation, so to speak on the, on, on, on words, the tongue and how we use our words. It says in James chapter three, verse one, he says, my brethren, be not many teachers knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation or the greater judgment. Now, we always, uh, when I was a Protestant, we used to always think of that in terms of, you know, God, judgment before God. Well, that's true, but he's, when you'll see, what you'll see from the next verse, though, is he's talking more about the judgment you're going to face from other people. He says, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. He says, it's a sign of perfection or maturity or completeness. If you, if you don't offend with your words, but we are so easily, we offend each other. People get so offended by things. They are just automatically, offense is such an easy thing to happen. He says, behold, behold he says, we, we put bits in the, in, the, in, the, in the horse's mouth, a bit in the bridle that he's talking about, that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, though they be so great and are driven by fierce winds, yet they turn about with a very small rudder. With us, whoever the governor lists, in other words, however well, the captain wants to see the ship, a small rudder will turn a big ship. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things, he says. Behold how great of matter a little fire kindles. Our word, the power of what we can say, how easily we can offend people. He says, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among all our members. It defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on the fires of hell. The tongue, and the words can create so many problems, he says. He's every kind of beasts and birds and serpents and, and, and things of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. He says, with, with, with our tongue, he says, we bless, therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith we curse we men. We are, we are, we, who are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and, and cursings. He says, these things not, not, to, not to be. You know, blessing one moment, cursing the next. But words are powerful. They affect us. He asked the question, he says, does a fountain send forth the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, brethren, bring bare olive tree, trees or either the vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation, which in the old English means lifestyle, his works with meekness and wisdom. You know, you want to be wise, show it out of, out of your works with meekness, with humility and wisdom, first and foremost. He says, if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. This wisdom, notice there's a false wisdom. He's talking about bad things, bitter envying and strife. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every word. What about what's envy? Envy is like, you know, people say jealousy. Well, sometimes we can be jealous of something. We, we, I wish I had what that guy had. Envy is you resent that guy for having it, not you having it. Somebody gets a promotion at work ahead of you. Well, how come they got that? How come I didn't? How come nobody offered me that raise? How come nobody me on that job? Who are they? I'm better than them. I, it's an ugly sedition. You know what? People get that way just with arguments. They want to win an argument so much. You know, they want to win an argument so much. And have that argument's challenged or they, they react to it with, with, with emotion. That's why I've noticed sometimes uh, some, some of my commentators on here, they get angry all of a sudden. And they start flying with the insults. The ad hominem begins. You know, the ad hominem, which is Latin for at the, to the man. You know, you, whenever some, you're arguing with somebody, if they start attacking you personally and insulting you and things like that, you know, that's first of all two things. It's a sign of a weak mind, number one. They don't have a good handle on their argument. And number two, it, it's like you get, you get personal because you're so angry. You know, understand this. If something angers you, it's touched something in you. All right. Maybe it's something you need to examine. You know, but there shouldn't be anger over it. We live in a society now, of course, where, where, where young people on college campuses have to have safe spaces and don't want to hear a conflicting opinion and want to be kept safe and secure, you know, from any, anything that would conflict with them. So you label whatever anybody else believes that's opposite of you as somehow horrible and hateful and dangerous instead of listening to the idea they want to shut it down. 
this is a, a dangerous, crazy time we're living in now. And, 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 and but, I, but I see this on a, on a different scale, on an entirely different scale in, in the religious world, the church world, where there's just this, you know, this reaction to things. Well, we just need to love everybody. We just love, 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 love. You know, look at the Bible. We're told in the Bible to speak the truth in love, all right? Uh, you know, we're, you know, the, to, to speak the truth. We should, uh, there should be a willingness to confront, uh, you know, in the kind of conversations. We have to be aware of how that works in our lives. But it's very easy to lose sight of that. And how we talk matters, too. In the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 4, in verse 6, we're told this. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. That you may know how you ought to answer every man. Season your words with grace. See, let your words be with grace. You need to trust the grace of God when you're going to speak. Trust the grace of God. We have to do that when we're speaking. I pray diligently that I'll, that I'll speak effectively on this on this channel and, and and say things that are true and hopefully not say it in an offensive way. Sometimes I use humor, and I know humor sometimes offends people, and I apologize that, that, that offends you, but sometimes the truth can communicate effectively with humor, so sometimes we use humor. But the fact of the matter is, we, should, we, should, we need to trust grace for our words. I try to trust grace for our words and season your words with salt. In other words, put some good flavor into those words. How we say something makes a difference. How we speak to people makes a difference. You know, it's, uh, Joe, we used to talk about, <laughs> um, back when I was a pastor, you know, uh, we'd do this as a sermon illustration. I'd, say, I'd so look at somebody who, had, in our church, people brought Bibles to church. I'd say, you, you know, I could say to you, is that your Bible? Or I can say, is that your Bible? What is that, your Bible? I can say, I can ask the same question two or three ways, and it can be, it sound completely different. How do we speak to people? Now, please don't misunderstand this. We're not talking about political correctness, about namby pam being around, and again, so afraid to offend. You know, you need to be able to willing to be to speak the truth and, and recognize when there's distinctions and, and 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 have decent arguments and 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 provide you know evidence for what you truly believe. You believe that's important, but. You know, but it shouldn't descend into anger. It shouldn't descend into rage. It shouldn't descend into this mindset of just quickly just spouting something out. You know, season those words. Just like f food has to be seasoned to taste better. It might still have the same nutrients in it, but if you don't season it, it'll be a lot tougher to eat. People might spit it out. They don't want to hear it. Well, it's the same way with words. You know, season your words. Know how you want to answer everybody. Know how to, re how to respectfully speak to people's situations. You know, it should matter to us. You know, how we, t how we talk matters. You know, and, and, and again, if we're, if we're operating with envying and strife, if we look back at James again for a minute, the, at the scripture in, in James chapter 3, he says again, uh, if you, in verse 14, if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. This wisdom, it's a wisdom, but it's a false wisdom, descends not from above, is earthly, it's sensual, it's devilish. It's based all on the senses, and it ultimately it comes from a demonic force. For where envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. He says, contrarywise, the wisdom that is from above is fierce, pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. In other words, there should be a peaceful demeanor and a, and a willingness to just be excited and, and proclaim the truth. You know, uh, you know, why, you know, why do you do this channel? I do this channel because I spent 30 years in the Protestant pulpit proclaiming things that were distorted, that were not uh, accurate. I tried to be accurate to the Word of God. I'm, maybe I preached some good sermons and bad sermons, but I, I realized that I, I had a major piece missing. When I discovered and realized that Jesus had founded a church, and that church uh, had the fullness of truth, I, I ran back to that church and came home to that church. And there's the solidity and a strength about that. And so it's, it's, it's disheartening, you know, when I go to Mass, and I think this is the most amazing, miraculous, awesome experience that's taking place on that altar. And Jesus, read, you know, the spread wine becomes the body and blood and soul of any Christ. And, 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 and some, and, but some Protestants say, it's blasphemy, it's heresy, it's pocus, pocus. It's, you know, when one person has joy and peace over something, another, another person is disdaining it, you know. It's like the realization of what it is, you know. But my desire isn't to argue and, yeah, yeah, you're wrong. My desire is, is, is to proclaim the truth and to see that truth. To take a, I've taken a skeptical eye to Protestantism, I've taken a skeptical eye to different things in my life, and examined it to come to conclusions, not just to live in a mindless skepticism. That's why I, I call it the Catholic skeptic rather than so many skeptics are atheists and agnostics. Yes, I'm a skeptic who believes in God, who believes in Christ, who believes in absolute truth. 
But I've examined that rigorously and I've seen that, that, that reasoned arguments to, to defend that truth because yes, God says in Isaiah 118, come let us reason together, saith the Lord. Reason is not contrary to faith. Faith goes out beyond reason. It takes you farther than your reason has, but reason should get you on that road. It shouldn't be uh, totally contrary. You know, God is reasonable. And we want to understand that truth in our lives and have that understanding. But it begins with proper communication. How we perceive things, how we listen, learning to listen and listen effectively and knowing when to speak. You know, we, you know, we're told in James to be, you know, slow to speak, slow to wrath, quick to hear. We need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath because the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God, it says in James chapter 1. We want to be aware of that, of that principle. But that comes with that understanding. And, and to understand you have a relationship with God. And you're secure in a relationship with God regardless of what anyone believes or doesn't believe it. You know, when I do these messages, even though I'll go back and forth in, in the comments and, you know, sometimes it's, it, it, it gets a little debate-like in the back and forth in the comments. But understand this. I'm not per se trying to convince you. I'm trying to show you that your argument might be wrong and there might be another way to look at it. But either way, at the end of the day, it's up to you. You can believe or not believe it. You know, I'm not, I'm going to claim the truth whether you accept it or don't accept, but I'm going to try and, and show you the reason path to get there. But I'm not going to spend my time squirming and struggling when you don't want to hear it. And sometimes I do notice sometimes in the responses, again, some people just advocate they don't argue. An argument, I don't mean a screaming yell match, I mean a genuine intellectual argument is you present reasons for what you believe. Some of, some of my project members do that and I try to respond back to them. But some of you guys don't. You just simply reframe the, we just quote scripture. What's the gospel? What's the gospel? What does Peter say the gospel? What does James say the gospel? Some of our dispensational friends are the most, you guys who you are, are most prominent with this. Why you keep watching, I have no clue. But understand this. If you want to have a discussion with me, back and forth in the comments, eventually I stop responding because it's, it's, you're not really arguing. You're just restating the case. I've had people cut and paste long sermons to me. You know, I preach just as the sermons are real similar. I get what the sermons say. But you need to present an argument that would, that would make sense. And solo scriptura itself is not an argument. Nowhere does the Bible teach that scripture alone is the foundation of authority. The scripture doesn't teach that. And it has been, and you know, I'll hate to hear it, but the Catholic Church is the one that gave you that Bible, that complete Bible, the New Testament. Yes, they were written in the first century, but it was compiled and put together by the church almost four centuries later. Before the New Testament, 27 books were there. See, that makes a difference when you're just going to quote me scriptures. All right. But see, again, this involves reason, involves logic, and involves rationality and discussion. And it doesn't come with this rage and anger. I'm not angry about it. I'm excited about the truth. But you want to have that, 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 that kind of resistance. Hey, if you're secure what you believe, that's great. But if you're going to keep on writing and keep on watching or pretending to watch, I know, I know I've had some, some who, who, who watch the show, but you don't actually, I mean, who, who write in the commentary because you're arguing against the title. All right. You don't like the title I, I wrote, so you're arguing against the title without actually hearing what the argument is. I, uh, the purgatory one fascinates me with that. You know, I've given scriptural argument for the for the reality of purgatory, explaining what purgatory actually is, and I'm like, purgatory, not purgatory, and I'll just say things that are contradicting everything I said in the video, and uh, not not arguing against it, but just because they never heard the video, they never watched, they just assumed they knew all, they knew that's not biblical, and they just chose to to go that way. All right. You know, again, you need to listen. We need to listen to each other and have a genuine conversation. There's something really worthwhile about that. But this comes from understanding our own heart and where we're at. And where we're at with how we, how we talk in the first place. In Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, a great statement. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth. Let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou art upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. We need to be trembling before God's presence. Trembling before who he is. Realizing the reality of that. And when it comes to what so-and-so is doing or what so-and-so's actions are taken, for my Catholic vlogger brothers and sisters out there, you know, he's so obsessed with what the Pope's doing and so obsessed with what happened with Bishop Strickland and some of these different issues that are coming out. Listen, do you, we don't know all the facts. I don't know all the facts. You don't know all the things that are going on. Pray for the Holy Father. Pray for these bishops. Pray for the situations. Just like with the Synod, people were shooting their mouth off where they even know what the Pope responded to when he was asked questions in the dubia. 
Pope responded. In fact, the people who asked the questions published the questions without publishing his answers. The Vatican had to publish the answers because sometimes they, we, have, we have a stake in it. They're hoping maybe I've caught, I've discovered the conspiracy and I'm going to reveal it. That's not the proper motive when it comes to things like that. We shouldn't be excited about gossip. We shouldn't be excited about slander. We shouldn't be excited about revealing something nobody's ever heard before about this or that. That's not how it works. In Christ, we deny ourselves. We take up our cross daily and we follow him. We want to speak the truth, but in love. And we want to get a hold of the truth first. Now, if we're not talking about the truth of the word of God or a real doctrine, a real dogma in the church, if we're talking about circumstances and events and opinions of people or the actions of people or stuff behind the scenes where we're not privy to the information, it's very, 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 very important that we have a humble heart about those things. Not be running off at the mouth about circumstances and situations. You know, Jesus told us in Matthew 18, if your brother has a offense against you, go to your brother. We we'll never do that. They always go around, I want to tell you about what so-and-so said about me. My first response when I remember one of the prospects, well, did you talk to them yet? And they said, no. And that person was present. I'd take him and I'd say, well, let's go talk to him right now. Well, I don't want to talk to them. If you have a problem with somebody, go to the person. If the person will hear you, then take two or three witnesses. If they won't hear witnesses, then you take it to the church, church authority, in other words. How, there's a process to things. But most of us try to avoid those processes completely. It's much easier to talk about someone, than, even the story of Martha and Mary in the Bible. Remember where Mar Mary sat at Jesus' feet and Martha was covered about much serving? You know, Mar when you re at the beginning of the story, Mar 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 Martha comes to Jesus and she, and she says, Lord, bid my sister that she come and help me. You tell her to come help me. Why didn't Martha just go to Mary and say, hey, Mary, can you help me out here? I need help out with the serving part. No, she talked about her to Jesus. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're careful and troubled about so many things. One thing's needful. She's chosen that good part, which shall not be taken from her. Not saying that her part was wrong. He wasn't bashing the Marthas of the world, saying that you gotta, it's wrong if you're busy serving and helping. Serving and helping is a wonderful thing. That's a very important thing. But Mary chose the good part in this case, was to sit and hear his word, at his feet and hear his word. But we always want to do an end run around about somebody else, talk about, about somebody else instead of to them. We're going to talk about people, but not to the people. We shouldn't say anything behind someone's back that we're not afraid to say in front of their face. And we shouldn't be talking behind people's back unless we, of course, believe uh, unless, unless we're really part of the problem and need to help solve it or part of the solution, and you can solve it. If you just want to hear the latest information, that's not good. Guard your hearts with all diligence. Out of it flow the issues of life, the forces of life. Guard our hearts. Guard our mouths. Be slow to speak, slow to anger. Quick to hear and listen carefully. Let our words be few. We have fear and trembling before our God. That's something we have to recognize in our lives. And it's going to make all the difference. And especially to my Catholic brothers out there with all the issues going on in the church right now that's in the news. Use that wisdom. Take your time. Pray. Learn all you can learn with a good heart. Not because you want to be proven right or wrong. You want to prove this right or wrong. Not because you want to uncover a conspiracy. Just because you want to, you, want, you want to know truth and walk in truth. But if you're not praying... For the Pope, how dare you talk against him? If you're not first and foremost praying and having a concern to seek God's wisdom and God's light, stay in your own lane. Do your thing. Focus on what you're supposed to do. It's something we have to recognize because you can get all messed up inside. You can get bitter and angry and envious and there are deadly things. You don't want to go, you don't want to fall into that trap. You know, when Yoda, to Yoda talked about, you know, Fear leads to hate. Hate leads to the dark side. All right. Things do lead to other things. You get caught up in worry, it becomes tormenting fear. It becomes fear, it becomes a phobia, it becomes a, a torment of the mind. You, you start down a road of, of suspicion and looking for, and you're a fault finder and a suspicious person. You can say, first, I want to discern the truth, but you're really just looking for faults. You'll find faults everywhere you look. I've seen people who, everything they look at, they, they, it's not just half, this glass half empty or half full. Everything, they see the bad right away. What we choose to look at makes a difference. What we choose to focus on, in other words, we see a whole lot of stuff and we hear a whole lot of stuff, but what are you focusing your attention on? All right? Pay attention. It's the money of the mind. Pay attention. Pay attention to what you should be paying attention to. And don't lose sight of the priority of the Lord in your life and who he is. All right, that's enough for now. 
Please hit like and subscribe. Please keep the comments coming in. Good, bad, and ugly doesn't matter. Appreciate all them coming in. All of, all of them that come in to me. God bless you. Go forward with him. All right. Seek the truth and speak the truth, but do it in love and have that kind of heart. Thanks for watching. See you next time.